we often don't think about the autonomic nervous system because it runs in the background and carries out a number of reflexes that are outside of conscious control. But this thing is pretty great because it allows us to not think about things like how we move our blood around or how we move food and liquid through our digestive tract and how we, we regulate respiratory and, and cardiac rates. In this lecture we're going to give the autonomic nervous system a little bit of the attention that it deserves. Uh, first we'll cover the sympathetic and then parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, we'll touch on the hypothalamus a little bit uh, because this is an important regulator of autonomic uh, nervous system function and it also communicates with the body itself. And we'll wrap up our discussion of the hypothalamus by discussing the generation of circadian rhythms by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The sympathetic nervous system uh, can be summarized as fight or flight. So we're going to stimulate the body to expend some energy to either get away from danger or to handle that danger. So in the autonomic nervous system we're talking about uh, output from the brainstem and spinal cord to really the the rest of the body dealing mostly with smooth uh, muscle of course cardiac muscles also going to be included there as well as glandular tissues so the autonomic nervous system is going to regulate a variety of functions uh, whether it be parasympathetic which is uh, priming us for energy storage or sympathetic which primes us for energy expenditure these are going to have a dual innervation of target tissues involved with respiration, um, circulation of blood, uh, regulation of temperature, digestion, excretion, as well as reproduction and immune system function. In each of these, the sympathetic and parasympathetic input will have polar opposite effects acting either as gas or brake so we can increase or decrease the function of these target tissues. An important function of the autonomic nervous system is to regulate blood pressure. We want to properly move blood around so that things like this don't happen. So in this video, uh, this young lady has stood up off the couch and she's playing with her dog by moving her hand around. It makes some shadows. The dog jumps on them. What stands out more in this video is her loss of consciousness and drop to the ground. This is caused by postural hypotension. So when she stood up, her blood was subject to gravity just like everything else, and it was pulled from her head. Normally, we respond by increasing the movement of blood into the head. You can see that she's fine here. But if we don't properly move blood around, we'll suffer a little dizziness, maybe some stars in our eyes or blurred vision, loss of balance or even loss of consciousness. So it's important that we move blood around. And again, this is something that we don't think about because it happens automatically. We'll cover the barrel reflex in a little bit. So the autonomic nervous system can be divided into sympathetic, fight or flight, and parasympathetic, rest and digest. These are going to have opposite effects on the target tissues. Sympathetic will stimulate the heart, inhibit the GI tract. Conversely, parasympathetic will slow down the heart and facilitate digestion. In both cases, we're going to be, we're going to be operating with a pair of neurons. So there's going to be a preganglionic autonomic neuron. This is going to live in the central nervous system and a postganglionic autonomic neuron. These are going to live outside in some kind of ganglion. So whether we're in the spinal cord or brain stem, in the sacral spinal cord, we have the rest of our parasympathetic. These are going to have long fibers here acting on short fiber postganglionic. So the postganglionic neurons are going to be very close to the target tissues compared to the sympathetic neurons that are going to be in the thoracic and upper lumbar spine, 
So these are going to hit the, for the most part, sympathetic chain ganglia. Some of them will bypass and hit the paravertebral ganglia. But for the most part, the pre-ganglionic neurons are going to have shorter fibers and the post-ganglionic are going to have the longer fibers. So sympathetic, we're going to find postganglionic closer to the central nervous system. Parasympathetic, the postganglionic neurons are much closer to the target tissues. In the sympathetic nervous system, we're dealing with the thoracic and upper lumbar spine. Those at the top of the thoracic spine are going to tend to innervate the top of the body, so head, eyes, neck, things like that. Down to the lumbar portion of the spinal cord, we're going to hit lower areas of the body, so here we're going to be dealing with the gut uh, bladder, things of that nature. So there's a rostral to caudal organization. If we were to look at a slice through the spinal cord, we of course have our white matter on the outside, dorsal, now in a lateral horn, and the anterior horn. So you see this extra bulge here, and in the lateral horn is where we find our preganglionic autonomic neurons in the spinal cord. In the brain stem, they're going to be in cranial nerve nuclei for cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. In both divisions, we're going to be releasing acetylcholine that's going to act on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So it doesn't matter which branch you're on. The preganglionic releases acetylcholine, postganglionic has nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Again, there's a thoracic to lumbar organization here, and we need to stimulate nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. If you knock out nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, no more postganglionic response in that sympathetic chain ganglion. That's what they've recorded here. Notice the robust depolarization in response to presynaptic stimulation. Whenever we knock out nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, no response. The largest collection of postganglionic sympathetic neurons are going to be here in the uh, paravertebral column or the sympathetic chain ganglia. So this is a paired structure that runs adjacent to the spinal cord and it contains postganglionic sympathetic neurons. These will hit from head to leg in a rostral to caudal organization. Some of these preganglionic neurons are going to bypass the sympathetic chain ganglion and hit 104 prevertebral ganglia. These are not paired structures, uh, but these are going to be found for the most part on the descending aorta, and these are going to innervate the GI tract, urinary tissues, and genitals. So these are going to play a, a bigger role in the uh, excretion processes of the body. The postganglionic sympathetic neurons release norepinephrine, so this makes them different from all the others. Everything else in the autonomic nervous system is releasing acetylcholine. Postganglionic sympathetic release norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is going to act on adrenergic receptors. And it's going to have different effects depending on the target tissue. The biggest collection are going to be the beta adrenergic receptors. And it doesn't matter what kind of beta, it's going to be GS coupled. Alpha 1, GQ, Alpha 2, GI. So depending on which adrenergic re receptor you have, you can get very different responses depending on the G protein that you have. In the heart, GS coupled beta adrenergic receptors increase heart rate. They also increase contractility uh, of the cardiac uh, muscles there. Here we can see the increase in heart rate. So here they're just applying successive doses, that's the x-axis there, of beta adrenergic agonists. So there's a couple different ones shown there, and they both cause the same effect. That is an increase in heart rate, shown on the Y. On the other hand, in the GI tract, the beta adrenergic receptors, which are present on smooth muscle, actually cause relaxation. And this has to do with how smooth muscle works.
an increase in cyclic AMP stimulates protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is going to inhibit myosin light chain kinase. This is critical for actin myosin interactions in smooth muscle. So, what GS receptors do is prevent actin myosin interactions, causing relaxation. There are also alpha 2 adrenergic receptors, which are GI coupled, and those are present on the parasympathetic fibers. So, this decreases the amount of parasympathetic input at those sites, which is why alpha 2 agonists are going to decrease the activity in smooth muscle. So in this case, we're just looking at the activity in the guinea pig uh, ilium. You can look at longitudinal and circular muscle contractions. You can also look at the peristaltic flow of, uh, of food through the ilium there. As you increase the dose of clonidine there, you increase the amount of alpha-2 activity, and you decrease then parasympathetic input. So you get a slowing of movement in the GI tract. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is going to stimulate energy storage. So we're going to need to digest our food so we can pull energy out of it and store it. There's still an organization here. Now, we're not in the thoracic and lumbar spine. We're in either the brainstem or the sacral spinal cord. So these would be the bread and the sandwich, and the sympathetic would be the meat. But there's still an organization. The higher up you go, the higher you are in the body. So the midbrain, which has the oculomotor nerve, is going to the eyes. Down in the medulla, where we have uh, the, the vagus nerve, for example, there we're, we're going to hit from the throat on down to basically the proximal portions of the colon. <clears throat> the sacral spinal cord is going to pick up where the medulla, I'm sorry, where the uh, vagus leaves off. It'll hit the rest of the colon as well as the urinary tract and genitals. In this case, acetylcholine all across the board, preganglionic and postganglionic. Now the postganglionic fibers are going to be found on or very close to the target tissue. So here we can see postganglionic parasympathetic neurons on the trachea. So red is just showing us choline acetyltransferase. Of course they have this because they create acetylcholine. And then what is that? Calretinin. This is um, just a, a, a calcium binding protein that you're going to find in neurons there. The green and the red line up because we have neurons that make coin acetyltransferase. But what we're looking at here is neurons living on the trachea. The parasympathetic output is going to act on muscarinic receptors. So the postganglionic neurons release acetylcholine and that acts on muscarinic. We got really two classes. There's the odds. So the odds would be M1, 3, and 5. And the evens. Odds are GQ, evens are GI. <coughs> GI coupled receptors present at the heart are going to slow heart rate because they decrease the amount of cyclic AMP and they slow pacemaking. Here we can see what happens if we inhibit muscarinic acetylcholine receptors with, uh, with additional doses of atropine. You can see the heart rate increases because we're blocking those GI couple of receptors. Down in the GI tract, GI would actually be stimulating. So are the GQ coupled M3 receptors. M3 seems to play more of a role here. So, this mess of data is just showing you what happens whenever you uh, apply the muscarinic uh, agonist here, carbocol in this case, in wild type or knockouts. So in this case they're knocking out either M2, M3, or both. You see the biggest effect um, when we knock out M3. So here we're looking at the bladder on top, males on the left, females on the right, ilium on the bottom, males on the left, females on the right. So we have consistency between the two sexes there. Uh, in the bladder it seems almost exclusively M3. Down in the GI tract there's probably some M2 there and since we're dealing with smooth muscle, GI will also stimulate it. 
<clears throat> so these two branches of the autonomic nervous system are going to work together in the barrel reflex. That reflex that allows our blood pressure to remain fairly constant. So let's say we have a change in blood pressure. We're going to automatically change the size of our blood vessels to respond so we don't get dangerous decreases in blood flow to the head or dangerous increases. So if we have, let's say, an increase in our blood pressure, this is going to be sensed by stretch receptors on a few different cranial layers. Cranial layers 9 or 10 are going to work together to sense blood pressure and they're going to feed into uh, the, the medulla. They're going to arrive at the nucleus of the solitary tract. So here's our brain stem. That's the BS we're dealing with right now. So the solitary tract nucleus here has a few different nuclei. In this case, the baroreceptor nuclei is going to be stimulated by an increase in blood pressure. This is going to do a couple of things. First, it's going to increase parasympathetic output from the nucleus ambiguous. Nucleus ambiguous with the M sound there is a motor nucleus, so it's an output. This will stimulate the vagus then to decrease activity of the heart, decrease heart rate via those M2 muscular and acetylcholine receptors. So we increase parasympathetic output when we have an increase in blood pressure. The other thing we do is inhibit sympathetic output. So we'll stimulate the uh, caudal ventral lateral medulla, which then inhibits the rostral ventral lateral medulla. So put these together. We're going to have a decrease in the activity of our rostral ventral medulla. This contains adrenergic neurons that are going to stimulate sympathetic output down there in the thoracic spinal cord. So we decrease sympathetic output and that decreases the activity of our beta adrenergic receptors. Both of these are going to act together to decrease heart rate and contractility so that we can decrease our blood pressure. If there's a drop in blood pressure, this whole thing flips. We'll have a decrease in activity in our baroreceptor nucleus. We'll decrease inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system, so we have an increase in sympathetic output. And we'll decrease activity in the nucleus ambiguous, so we have decreased parasympathetic output. And that allows us to have fairly stable blood pressure as we move throughout the day and as we change body position. Now, there's only so much we can do here. If you stand on your head, blood will still pool there. Your face will still get red. But this helps... Uh, counteract some of the more subtle changes that we get with just sitting, standing, lying down. Now the regulator of these two branches is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus projects axons along a tract called the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. It's one of my favorite tracts, uh, as if you care. The dorsal longitudinal fasciculus is going to regulate the activity of those neurons in the brainstem or in the spinal cord and it's going to create then the visceral response to emotion. So the, the hypothalamus is the master regulator of our autonomic nervous system and it does that uh, through long axonal projections into the brainstem and down the spinal cord. And this is how our emotions are then able to create an autonomic response. Now the hypothalamus itself uh, contains a variety of different nuclei that are all involved in different functions. Besides creating that dorsal longitudinal fasciculus, the hypothalamus also um, works with the pituitary to regulate neuroendocrine signaling. And that is how it's going to have an impact on essentially every tissue in the body. And depending on the nucleus we're talking about, they're going to be involved in different functions. The paraventricular nucleus is uh, particularly important uh, to bring up here because uh, it's going to be involved in stress response. Uh, which we'll, we'll cover just so we have one uh, example here. It also contains large magnocellular neurons that directly release uh, hormones into circulation along with the supraoptic nucleus. Also a very important nucleus because it plays a role in detecting whether or not we're thirsty. And in fact, 
Let me make sure I don't have any abnormal hypothalamic activity here. There are a couple uh, nuclei involved with reproduction. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we have our suprachiasmatic nucleus that's going to play a role in generating circadian rhythms. Now, think of the hypothalamus and the pituitary as a pair. These are going to work together. Now, the pituitary itself looks like a pair, uh, and it is. It's a pair of structures here. So the hypothalamus, we can cut that up into a bunch of different nuclei. And we'll see some examples uh, later on of some important hypothalamic nuclei. The pituitary we can think of as a two-part structure. So the large magnocellular neurons will project down into the posterior pituitary, while the smaller parvocellular neurons are going to project to the median eminence. This is going to contain some blood vessels, which we'll make blue here. And they're going to be kind of interconnected. This is the portal capillary vasculature. And this is going to carry hormones from the hypothalamus down into the anterior pituitary, where tropes are going to respond and spit out a different hormone. So in both cases, we're releasing hormones. Uh, in, into the cavernous sinus, so a big old pool of uh, returning blood that surrounds the pituitary. In the anterior, we have to do a, the old swaparoo from a hypothalamic hormone to a pituitary hormone. In the posterior, just direct release. Now the hypothalamus is a great place to regulate neuroendocrine signaling as well as autonomic function because it's so well connected. It has input from the limbic system, such as the amygdala and hippocampus, so it has some idea about our emotional state, uh, recent memories, and it's also connected with the forebrain, so it knows what we're trying to do. It has some idea about our plans, and this is how emotion uh, and, and knowing, for example, that you have to get up in front of a group and speak uh, will create those visceral responses. Your hypothalamus can create a stress response, which we'll go through in just a bit. And it can also regulate your autonomic nervous system through that dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. But for the most part, we're going to just focus on the pituitary here. So we got our small parvocellular neurons that then communicate via the portal vascular uh, uh, portal capillary vasculature here to affect the anterior pituitary. Now the site of release is at the median eminence. The cool thing about the median eminence is that it has a leaky blood-brain barrier. So the capillaries here have little breaks in them and that allows hormones to get into blood. That's exactly what you need to have happen so it can be carried down into the pituitary. Here at the median eminence, we see a collection of dense core vesicles. Next to our capillary bed here, those dense core vesicles are, of course, filled with peptides, hormones. So not classical neurotransmitters being released, other than a little dopamine. Other than that, peptides. That's what it's all about. Those peptides that then get carried down to the anterior pituitary, and they get exchanged for another hormone. The magnocellular neurons in the paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei project directly down into the posterior pituitary to release their hormone into the um, cavernous sinus. A couple notable examples would be vasopressin. It's going to play a role in fluid uptake and oxytocin, which plays a role in reproduction from uh, before it happens uh, all the way up till childbirth. And even after that, there'll be some milk release too. Oxytocin all along the way. We won't talk about that. Let's focus on our stress response. Uh, because you're probably not reproducing um, successfully yet. Uh, I hope not anyway. But you're probably having stress responses as you're preparing for classes and things like that. So it's worth understanding. So our stress response is the hypothalamus, 
pituitary, and then adrenal glands, HPA axis here. So the old switcheroo is going to go as such. Corticotropin releasing hormone is going to be carried down from the hypothalamus into the anterior pituitary. This is going to get switched for adrenal corticotropic hormone. This is going to travel through systemic uh, uh, vasculature to eventually release, I'm sorry, to eventually encounter the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex then does one final switcheroo here. And we uh, transfer adrenal corticotropic hormone into glucocorticoids. Stress hormones, for example, cortisol, corticosterone, and these are going to create that stress response. Still a hormone. These are still going to circulate throughout our body and regulate gene expression. That's what hormones do. Now you can see daily fluctuations in hormones. <clears throat> no surprise there, we see fluctuations in, in hypothalamic activity. So one of the hormones that stimulates this stress response is vasopressin. Uh, also called antidiuretic hormone. Please act as a pair. And you can see here the circadian oscillation in vasopressin levels. Now part of what this will do is, is act on the anterior pituitary and then stimulate a little bit of a stress response. So you can see the daily fluctuation there. When we have our stress response, the release of stress hormones causes them to then bind to the glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid receptors. These are transcription factors that live in the cytoplasm and upon hormone binding the inhibitory complex is released, they move to the nucleus and affect gene expression. They're going to do a few different things depending on where they act. Now, in the central nervous system, what they're going to do is provide some negative feedback. They're going to act on GABAergic interneurons and cause them to inhibit these hypothalamic neurons. So the feedback of stress hormones helps turn this whole system off by stimulating inhibitory interneurons. So we don't have chronic stress, because chronic stress decreases neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So what we're looking at here are counts of neurons, that would be something that expresses neuron-specific enolase, any of those cells we call neurons, uh, that have radioactive thymidine labeling. In other words, that we're looking for neurons who have recently synthesized their DNA. We call those newborn neurons. And the count of that is summarized on top in the bar graph there. So, apply a stress hormone, you see fewer newborn neurons in the hippocampus. Remove the uh, adrenal glands, you see a far greater number of neurons in the hippocampus. Since we think newborn neurons in the hippocampus are probably important for memory function, we think of this as an explanation for the memory impairments we get with chronic stress. Now, in the periphery, what's going to happen is an increase in heart rate transiently, followed by a decrease in heart rate. And that's what these data are showing here. What they did was chase geese around, catch them, that's kind of stressful, and then they give them an injection either a sham injection or, or an actual injection of adrenal corticotropin releasing hormone. This. When we inject this into the blood, it stimulates the adrenal glands to release stress hormones. I put a red line there to show you the change in heart rate. So there's a brief elevation when the geese get chased around. That makes sense. This is likely due to sympathetic output acting on the adrenal medulla. But the stress response acting on the adrenal 
cortex causes glucocorticoid release, which actually decreases heart rate. Whether you're a goose or a human, same thing, you get a decrease in the heart rate. And this makes sense. Stress response causes an increase uh, from the sympathetic, so you'd want another type of input to cause a decrease in heart rate so we don't get dangerous elevations. The other things that happen would be glucose release from the liver. This is priming us for action. We're having some kind of a stress response, so we need to do something. And also, suppression of inflammation. Because inflammation can lead to uh, pain. We don't have time to deal with pain if it's a stress response. But inflammation is also an important function in suppressing infection. And this is why with chronic stress, you see higher rates of sickness. Because one of those genes that are targeted by our stress hormones would be the pro-inflammatory -in genes and anti-inflammatory genes. And what we see then is a shift toward anti-inflammatory responses. So it's much harder to mount an immune response if you have an infection. Now, I want to focus in on the suprachiasmatic nucleus because this is going to generate our circadian rhythms. Here we can see some circadian rhythms in a few different uh, brain regions. The suprachiasmatic nucleus has the greatest fluctuation there. Other hypothalamic areas, like the subparaventricular zone, also see this uh, fluctuation. You'll see it also in the cortex, but not as clear. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the area where we, we think of as generating our rhythms. It's the clock of the hypothalamus, and thus the rest of the central nervous system. When you remove the suprachiasmatic nucleus, like we see here, so at the very top, everything's intact. Then where it says SCNX, they lesioned it. All the little black bars are showing you movement, and the blue bars are showing you when it's dark. The rats like to run around in the dark. There's no, no real circadian rhythm here. We tend not to see the, the, the movement during the dark periods. They're kind of all over the place. When they, re, uh, when they implant a new suprachiasmatic nucleus, they see the restoration of circadian rhythms. So it's all about the SCN. Now there's two parts. There's the core of the SCN, which has a vasoactive intestinal peptide. This is just a neuropeptide, the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus. And what that does is synchronize the activity, this along with electrical synapses. So it creates kind of rhythmic fluctuations in activity. What, what uh, vaso active intestinal peptides going to do is act on GS coupled receptors that are going to provide long-lived excitation. The shell of the suprachiasmatic nucleus contains GABAergic projection neurons that then project to other regions and inhibit their function. More on this in just a bit. Now the timekeeping of the suprachiasmatic nucleus is based on a few different transcription factors. So we're going to have oscillations of transcription factors some that are more uh, abundant at day and others at night. So we have transcriptional activators, clock, and pass to BMOL1, higher during night. And then we have our day transcription factors. These are going to be period and cryptochrome. Night, we're going to have clock in pass two and then B mall one. So these are going to pair up and affect the expression of one another. So clock B mall one and then N pass B mall one are going to form heterodimers and then it, it affect the expression of different genes. Uh, for example, um, uh, vasopressin, AVP, which is shown on top there. In clock mutants, which uh, don't, don't thus have the ability to pair up there and increase expression, you don't really see that circadian oscillation in vasopressin levels. They're also then going to promote the expression of Rev and Rora. So these are going to promote 
couple of other transcription factors. So, period and cryptochrome are going to dimerize here. They are going to bind to these day genes and repress their activity. So elevations in our day genes increases the levels of period and cryptochrome here. So these will increase day I'm sorry, night uh, genes will increase our day gene expression. Then what day genes do is reduce the activity of our night genes. So they provide a little negative feedback. So that the night genes drop, followed by the drop in day genes. So, when we have an increase in night genes, that's going to stimulate thus an increase in day genes. That increase in day genes is going to then inhibit the expression of night genes. Down they go. And that will decrease the expression then of day genes. As those drop down, night's going to come back up. And so you can see the pattern here, kind of like your typical predator-prey relationship. This gives you your oscillations in day and night genes. So there's a little feedback here between the day and night genes that's going to create those cycles. Now, these activators are going to contribute to that. So we increase expression of REV in this case. What REV will do is provide a little negative feedback to help create this drop in night gene activity. So it's going to decrease expression of BMOL1. So there's another round of negative feedback. What we have is delayed positive feedback though, because RORA is going to stimulate expression. What you've got to keep in mind, REV is early and RORA is going to be delayed. So we can drive another increase here. So this second cycle is going to be caused by RORA, but this drop here is going to be caused by period cryptochrome and rev. So we got some negative feedback and we got some positive feedback to get our second increase there and drive the whole thing over again. Now of course we have this internal clock of transcription factors that creates some basic cycles of gene expression that will make the superchiasmatic nucleus more or less excitable. But we're also sensitive to environmental cues. And the most obvious of those would be light. So some of the retinal ganglion cells within the retina are sensitive to light. So they're going to be intrinsically uh, photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, and they project from the retina to the hypothalamus and innervate the suprachiasmatic nucleus. There, they release the neuropeptide pituitary adenylate cyclase activating peptide. And the name there tells you that it's going to stimulate GS-coupled receptors and stimulate adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase is then going to stimulate protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is then going to stimulate CREB. CREB is, of course, a transcription factor that stimulates the expression of period. That is a P. You know what? It's not a P. Now it's a P. There we go. Period. One of those day genes. So when it's light outside, this retinohypothalamic tract, retinohypothalamic tract, allows for the release of uh, uh, 
the PCAP here into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So that we get an increase in the expression of day genes, like period. So this is going to help synchronize <coughs> hypothalamic activity with that in the world. So if we were to change time zones, if we were to uh, take a, a, a long trip somewhere else, and the day and night don't match up with our original, we can entrain our circadian rhythms in this way. <clears throat> of course, then the hypothalamus is then going to uh, it synchronize the peripheral responses through hormonal release, and also, of course, that dorsal longitudinal fasciculus that then stimulates that sympathetic activation that we get throughout the day. Now, the sleep-wake cycles are going to be regulated by different hypothalamic nuclei. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is the clock. This is the one that generates those fluctuations in activity. So the SCN is the clock. We're going to get those daily oscillations in activity. Now, the output of the shell is going to inhibit its targets. Ultimately, we're going to try to hit the lateral hypothalamic area to stimulate the release of orexin. Orexin is going to project widely. It's going to hit the cortex to stimulate the cortex, and it's also going to hit our reticular activating system to stimulate monoaminergic neurons that also lead to arousal of the cortex. So, let's have a look at the circuitry here. Now, of course, that shell of the SCN contains GABAergic neurons, so they're going to inhibit their target. In this case, the subparaventricular zone. By inhibiting the subparaventricular zone, it won't inhibit its target. In this case, the dorsal medial hypothalamus. Since it's not inhibited, it's active. Lateral hypothalamus then stimulated. This is our wake nucleus. The dorsal medial hypothalamus will also then inhibit the sleep area. That's the ventral lateral preoptic area. Now the lateral hypothalamus releases orexin. And what orexin does is stimulate its targets by acting on GQ coupled receptors. So it could be the cortex to directly wake us up, or it could be monoaminergic neurons in the reticular nuclei, and these inhibit the VLPO. And this creates a nice bit of reciprocal inhibition, so that when the lateral hypothalamus is active, the VLPO is not. Now, of course, we have oscillations of SCN activity. Now, when the SCN is less active, let's see what will happen at night. Or, of course, black makes sense for night. We'll, of course, have reduced inhibition. That's going to allow for the subventricular zone to be active and inhibit the dorsal medial hypothalamus. Well, now that it's inhibited, it no longer inhibits the BLPO and no longer stimulates the lateral hypothalamic area. The VLPO is free to inhibit the lateral hypothalamus. The reduction in orexin release further decreases inhibition of the VLPO. We're not stimulating our reticular formation and cortex, and thus we become drowsy and quickly fall asleep. So there's this reciprocal inhibition of sleep and wake circuitry. So that only one is going to be active. We often think of these as being on a teeter-totter. When one is a little more active, it's going to inhibit its target and decrease its own inhibition. But those circadian oscillations in the SCN are going to create oscillations in the activity here. So that when another becomes more active, in this case the sleep nucleus here, 
it prevents wake circuitry. So we have a clear change between the sleep and the wake. And that covers it for this lecture. If anything's unclear, fill out the questions box. I'll see you later.